Thank you. Um, all right, so we're gonna now move into Zed and we'll have his presentation. Uh, Sharice, thank you so very much, that was great. And we'll get uh, Zed to share his screen and here we go. Okay, let's go. Um, I thought I was going to be one of those people that got it right first time, but I've lost my screen sharing abilities. Um, yeah, here we go. Sharice, I was going to ask you a question as well. Are you guys seeing me on screen share? No, oh, now, now we see you back again, but I'm not on full screen share, am I? No, no, you are. No, you're not. OK, um, let me give it a go. I'm sorry, Zay, you said you had a question? Yeah, I do. I mean, it might be better to wait till the end, I guess. Uh, can you guys see my screen now? Yeah, we see your desktop. We see the browser move, uh, window. Yeah. So if you open up your video, it'll come yeah. Sorry, it's uh it's half twelve in the night here, so I'm uh, <laughs> I'm not thinking that clearly. So it should go to full screen now, I believe. Yep. There you go. Uh, Got it. Um. Don't forget yeah, that Therese. question for Sharice. Well, you know, it, maybe it should wait till afterwards, but it was going to be about um, when you guys were behind the scenes, you know, the press. Mm -hmm. Presumably you're in, in, in a large group of people. How many um, are It was probably 11 of us. So I'm just interested. I mean, Frank already asked you, you know, what was the mood and what was the discussion? And you said you were very somber and quiet. But yeah. I'm just interested to know if there's ever... Um, a debate or if you ever learn anything from people who have been on the beat for a long time about, you know, what could change. Um, but should we hold this for, for the yeah, end? Yeah, we'll hold it till later. You know, because it's, it's not a, a, an easy one. So let me just talk about my pictures and then we can talk about that afterwards. Um, so, you know, if, if you're not familiar with my work, I did produced a book called Gun Nation. Um, this was back in the year 2000. And it was a look at American gun culture. Now, at the time, um, the issue, as I saw it, was not, it was always framed as a kind of gang issue. So the typical American notion of the so-called gun problem was, I think, a sort of racial stereotype. People thought of it as a gang problem. Um, and therefore, it didn't really affect them. It wasn't really their problem. And so what I attempted to do was do a pr whole project, which took several years, which looked really ignored gangs um, and even crime on a, on a street level and looked at this kind of huge manufacturing industry and um, the how, how people kind of brainwash themselves into thinking that kind of freely available guns are good. Um, I'll just click through. Um, another couple of images, hold on. I'd shot, I mean, I'd worked in places like Somalia in 1992, and you know, these were war zones um, full of guns, often American weapons, often Russian, Chinese, British. Um, so I was a young photographer at this time, trying to understand the politics of these places. Um, and kind of understand why they were happening. But one sort of common denominator were these weapons that were sort of poured into the, into the country, often donated by foreign governments. Um, and so again, this is in Mogadishu in the port. Um, after doing those kind of jobs, I'd been in Somalia and, um, and Angola. This was in El Salvador. And I started getting sick of doing projects about gangs or even war, I started fearing that perhaps it was almost a sort of, again, a stereotypical view of, of different countries. So this story became a story about the gun. Uh, and this was an American uh, M16. And these had been donated by America to the right wing 
um, sort of very right wing, vicious squad in El Salvador. Um, so they'd been armed for political reasons. So I was sort of struggling to tell a sort of slightly more complex story. Uh, then I went to Afghanistan. Uh, this is Kabul. Um, this is the border. Everybody was trying to get out. And me and my journalist colleague had to go in. I mean, we were literally pushed through that gate into a sort of throng of people, feeling that we were perhaps going the wrong way. Um, in Kabul, it was at the time where the Mujahideen were at war with each other. Um, again, weapons from all of our own governments. Uh, I was in a car that got uh, ambushed and machine gunned. Uh, and so it became very personal as well. Uh, this was the seat where the journalist, my friend, was sitting. He survived, but was shot very, very badly. Um, this is him uh, soon after the shooting. Uh, he's actually fine now. I mean, as well as you can be when your bones have been sort of shattered by gunfire. But um, so at this point, things became very personal. Uh, I'd struggled with the politics of the things I'd seen. And then I'd seen kind of what a, a gun can do to the human body close up. And that finally, once and for all, kind of destroyed any romantic ideas I had about guns. Um, and it kind of occurred to me that in America, there was a sort of the statistics of gunfire are the statistics of a war. Um, and nobody was talking about it at that time in that way. As I said, it was often just conceived as a, a gun, a gang problem that had got out of hand. Um, so what I decided to do is photograph mainly white, middle-class Americans. I wasn't looking for these sort of fringe militiamen in the forests running around. Um, I wasn't looking for gangs. I was looking for what, I guess, self-styled, self so-called kind of law-abiding citizens of America, trying to understand the kind of psychology um, that underpinned this whole kind of um, love for the gun. This is Mike and his baby daughter in uh, Dallas. Uh, he said, it's my constitutional right to own a gun and to protect my family. Uh, not an unreasonable sentiment, um, you know, uh, and this kind of underpins this, the notion of, you know, why people feel they need guns. Um, this is a group of Memphis housewives with uh, their own guns, which they'd recently purchased. They'd all recently done a concealed carry uh, permit course, which allowed them to have these guns in their handbags. Um, and what was notable about these women was they were nice. They were very friendly towards me uh, and hospitable. But when they started talking about, you know, when I started quizzing them about why they needed guns, um, these kind of mantras came out, some of them slightly uh, racist, um, all about the fear of the other, all about protecting themselves with this intense sense of a fear of something uh, that they need to protect themselves from. Um, this is Sarah Reed. She was an 11 year old uh, whose dad owned the gun store uh, in Memphis. And she said, uh, I got a 410 shotgun from Santa Claus last year. Now, I mean, some of these are, there's almost comedy in some of like the image or certainly in, in the, the texts. Um, and I wanted the images at the time to reflect, for instance, here, these bullets, they're kind of like uh, pick and mix sweets. Um, so at that point, I was trying to think about how I photographed things as well. So I was shooting portraits, almost like family portraits with lighting and a backdrop. So they look like, so they look familiar. And these images of sweet, of, of sweets, of bullets uh, to show how kind of everyday things had become. This is uh, John and Kaywin Lanou, and they were born again Christians. And I said to her, 
you know, would you actually be prepared to kill someone? You know, surely that, that contradicts the biblical view. And she said, no, in the Bible, it doesn't say thou shalt not kill. It says thou shalt not murder. So this, as far as we're concerned, is okay. And she went on to say that she would shoot and kill anyone who threatened her or her family. Again, uh, you know, I'm not arguing with this idea that one should be able to protect themselves. Um, but what I became interested in was looking at the statistics and the facts behind gun ownership. Uh, and, you know, there were studies that showed that having a gun at home meant you were really seven times more likely to end up being shot and dying by gunfire. Um, yeah. 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 Just a question. So you're doing this project, you know, a, as a foreigner and yeah. you're, going, you're going through these people's homes and, you know, all of this. I mean, so the day is over and you, do you write notes, you know, to remember everything? And I mean, there's got to be a moment in here you're saying, I'm in a crazy world. Yeah. Yeah. Can, um, can you share some of like what you remember of, of these moments? Well, yeah, I would take notes. I would sometimes record, uh, in, I would interview people and record it uh, and then, you know, transcribe the interviews afterwards um, without making them feel like interviews because obviously people get more guarded. So I would try and make it as conversational as possible. Uh, and people then would speak much more openly. But I, these quotes from people were very important to me. Um, they were just as important as the images in a funny way. I like the combination of yeah. words and pictures. And then being, yeah, from outside, uh, it was truly uh, shocking in a way and bizarre to, to see these things. And actually for that same reason, I would, I would never stay longer than two weeks in the US and then I'd come back. So I made about five trips. And what I found is that after two weeks, everything started seeming normal and I would become used to it. And I needed for it to not seem normal. Uh, so I would go away and do something different for a, a while and then return. And that was an important, I don't know, way of working, I think for me. Um, and I also had to think about, like the first thing I did was I went to the NRA convention in Dallas. Um, actually, I'll get onto that in a minute because there's a couple of images from there. So what I was also thinking about was visually, this is shot on a medium format camera. Uh, again, it's got the aesthetics of a family portrait. It could be your parents. And that was intended. I wanted people to, in a way, see themselves in the pictures. Uh, and it's only, you know, on second inspection that you see this kind of hand clutching the gun. But equally, I wanted to shoot pictures that showed the sort of devastating reality of what guns do. So I spent 10 days in, in a hospital uh, just photographing uh, gunshot wounds in the emergency room. Uh, and I, I wanted to think and show and consider how... American gun culture had become a thing, how it had been romanticized, in a way created. Um, I mean, there's a lot of research that shows that, for instance, in the Wild West, people had guns, but there weren't that many and people had them as tools. They weren't, um, you know, they were, they were considered as a necessary tool that was used kind of carefully. Uh, and it was actually advertising companies in the North who sold the idea of the Wild West as being full of guns, as being this kind of heroic notion of, 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 of freedom and Americanism. And so this is a cardboard cutout of John Wayne, obviously, outside a Las Vegas gun store. So I wanted the images to kind of consider and, and think about uh, the romanticization of guns uh, and how this myth was built because it was literally um, kind of invented, you know, to sell guns. This is a Smith and Wesson uh, Magnum. This was the gun used by Clint Eastwood in the movie Dirty Harry. Uh, and so I'm sure most of you remember, you know, the famous line when he's got the criminal lying on the ground, and he's and he's 
he asks, he invites the guy to, to, to make a move for his gun. He says, come on, punk, make my day. And then he has a little lecture about how this gun will blow your head clean off. So this made this gun the best-selling gun in America in its day. It was since replaced by the Beretta 9mm, which was used by uh, Mel Gibson in Lethal Weapon, and so on and so on. And Arnold Schwarzenegger used another one in God knows what. Uh, and so Hollywood has also been very adept at selling guns um, and the idea of them. This is B&B's gun store uh, in Los Angeles. Um, and, the, and then I wanted to look at how kids, young people are inducted into this, uh, the gun culture. And so this is the NRA convention. And this is what I was gonna say to you. My first foray into this was I left London, flew to the NRA convention. Um, in fact, no, it wasn't. So it wasn't the NRA, it was a, just a typical gun show, the first thing I did. Uh, and I got there and walked around trying to photograph people and everyone basically told me to piss off uh, using slightly stronger language than that. And it was impossible to photograph people because they, they knew that you know, press coverage generally showed them in a bad light. Um, mm -hmm. So I had two days of uh, really being thwarted. And on the third day, I built a studio in the con at the gun show there was an empty booth where one of the gun manufacturers hadn't turned up so i built a studio with lights and umbrellas and you know and I, then i had a queue of people queuing up to be photographed um because they kind of somehow saw me as part of the show um so that was a way of kind of getting in to to, to photograph people uh these are the sort of typical kind of cliched ideas at the bottom guns don't kill people people kill people uh you know i.e don't blame the gun it's people that do it i mean technically correct but um obviously absurd because the gun is a kind of particularly certain weapons just sort of killing machines that make it very easy and this one at the top, burglar proof your home, buy a gun. So these are sort of important mantras that are, uh, are repeated and repeated, uh, particularly by the NRA. This was a guy called Sandy Chisholm, who's the uh, owner of the gun company. Um, and he, this was at the show I was telling you about where I built the studio. And so these people are very media um, averse. They don't wanna be interviewed by the media. But what something weird happened once I had this studio and they started coming up and going, what are you doing? You know, and I'd say, I'm just shooting pictures. And they would kind of say, do I have to pay? And I'd say, no, no, it's, you know, it's free. Um, and so this guy talked about the, the smallest gun they make that's designed for a lady's purse. And he assured me that they get several letters a year from satisfied customers who said they've killed someone with it. He said, it's no pea shooter. So again, these kind of lines were, were used in the, in the book and magazine article and exhibition. Uh, don't be a victim, buy a gun. So again, very important kind of marketing idea that's repeated and repeated and repeated. Um, uh, first on men, obviously, for many decades, and now women uh, and have been, tar have been uh, targeted by the advertising industries as you know, we must make them fearful of walking across the parking lot at night uh, and sell them a gun. Um, this is a woman in Los Angeles. Her husband's buying her a gun in a Los Angeles gun store. Um, and I said, what, well, you know, why, 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 what, you know, why are you buying it? And she said, well, it's for home protection. So, you know, anyone who knows anything about weapons, this is an AR-15 assault rifle. Um, designed for kind of jungle warfare where, you know, you need to kill multiple people quickly. Um, and as we know, these are weapons being used in the school shootings repeatedly. Um, so again, this, this was one of those moments, you know, when you just, you, you obviously, you know, in England, we have very different gun laws. Um, I mean, one thing I should add as well, that when I began the project, one of the things that compelled me to do it is that we had a school shooting 
in the UK. It was in Scotland. It was in a, in a place called Dunblane. And a guy, very, very similar to the American school shootings, guy went to a school and killed a whole bunch of young people, kids, and a teacher. And I can't remember how many. It doesn't matter in a way. Um, we're kind of always fixated by the number. And I think that's almost part of a problem that's, that's being created. But it, we're talking over 12. Um, and that sparked immediate and fierce debate about gun control in the UK and very, very uh, swift and strong gun controls were, were, were enacted. I mean, very different issues because there were far fewer guns in, in society here anyway. These are, this is ammunition. These are hollow point bullets um, designed. These are banned by the Geneva Convention. So the American military are not allowed to use these in a war, but they're the best selling ammunition in America for home civilian use. And the police use them. Um, and they, the police like them because they, they, they have what they call stopping power. They hit you, they don't have a point, and so they fragment and punch a big hole in you and go in different directions around your body. Um, so again, I wanted to photograph them almost seductively um, in the way that magazines like GQ magazine were photographing iPods and you know, in the language of, of how things are sold, but with a caption that talked about what I've just told you. So you'd be seduced by an, an image, you'd kind of almost think, what's going on? And then you'd read, you know, the story. Um, and then this whole idea of having a gun at home for home protection, which again, I, I don't begrudge anyone for, um, for demanding that in a way. Um, but this is a woman who's been shot in a domestic argument at home. Um, again, statistically, it's been shown that having a gun at home often leads to domestic argument killings, teenagers taking guns and misusing them, killing a friend by mistake, um, all sorts of problems, an intruder coming in and taking your gun. Um, obviously there are times where people protect themselves with a gun, but it's, it's far, far less than the NRA will have people believe. Um, and when these studies came out was when the NRA went to town on blocking these studies from being conducted. So they enacted gun laws that have made it illegal um, to study the effects of gun deaths um, by the CDC and, and other organizations, which is just a sort of extraordinary, uh, bizarre thing. Uh, I found out that the number one victim group in America from gunfire were middle-aged white men. Um, doesn't conform to the stereotype we have, and they're in, they're, most of them are suicides. So having a gun at home often uh, makes a suicide uh, very easy and quick. Uh, not always effective because a lot of people sort of blow their face off and survive. Um, but, you know, in the heat of the moment, there's a, a very large number of suicides as well. This is, a, this is the x-ray of someone who's shot themselves in the head. You can see the fragments of bullets in the skull. This is Grady Hinton. He blew his own leg off in a hunting accident. So what I also wanted to do in this project was to really strip away the glamour, show the kind of agonizing kind of pathetic realities of what guns can do to people. Um, Self-inflicted accidents. Um, there's a whole industry of prosthetic limbs for people that have shot their feet and legs off. Um, Was that Mr. blood in the trash cans, Ed? Uh, you know, that's a good question. I doubt it. I doubt it because this is a prosthetics lab. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, a place where you go and get your prosthetic fitted so it's not like an emergency area in a hospital so i guess it was just a dirty trash can you know it is a bit weird but yeah it's not it can't have been blood um this is a guy daniel green whose friend shot him in the leg 
in a drunken argument. They had a 45 caliber handgun and they were brandishing it around, drinking, and his friend shot him in the leg. Um, again, I was telling you about this prosthetics industry for people that have lost their feet in hunting accidents. And then as I was um, feeling like the project was coming to an end, uh, the Columbine High School shooting happened. Uh, if I remember rightly, I think 13 high school kids and, and two teachers were killed. Um, this was the morning after. Uh, and this, in a way, I mean, there'd been school shootings before, obviously, but this was, if you look at a graph of the number of school shootings and the fatalities associated with them, this was the beginning, in retrospect, I now see, of a, of a chart going way up, uh, a very noticeable kind of line upwards. Um, I spent about 10 days there and watched all the usual things that happen. And bearing in mind, this was some years ago now, um, but first of all, the horror and the agony and the pain, um, the media descend. Um, then there's memorials, church memorials, and then outside one church here, pray for healing. Um, Newspaper headlines saying, you know, we never thought it could happen here. Um, or these have become so familiar that they're painful to experience again and again. Um, and then while all of these things were being said, of course, less than a mile from the Columbine High School was this gun store with already ridiculously outdated sexist posters of women with guns in the window. Um, helping to market them, uh, business as usual. Um, and what happened in Columbine is that this big debate then followed about what to do about this terrible situation. And it really did feel like this was going to be a huge turning point back then. And what they came up with is, was an idea to ban black trench coats from schools in Colorado um, because the two uh murderers had gone to school with black trench coats in order to hide their their guns and so the, the guns weren't banned but but black coats were in schools and so you know another sort of painful irony and and, and sort of absurdity this is officer rawlins of the memphis police i was doing an interview and i just kind of this thing trundled past the door and I jumped up and looked in the corridor and there he was wheeling this thing down. And I said, you know, can I, can I photograph you? And he said, yeah, I guess so. Um, and I said, well, where are all these guns from? And he, he, he took me into the room on the right there. And it was like this huge room of, of crates and crates of guns piled up like all the way up the wall, like a sort of Aladdin's cave of weapons. And I said, what, what what, is, what are all these guns? And he said, they're all guns that have just been routinely confiscated when there's been a murder or a domestic violence. We bring them in. Um, and I said, wow, you know, how long has it taken to collect all these? And he said, oh, about three months. And I said, what happens to them? Fully expecting him to say, you know, we melt them down and make some piece of civic art or something. And he said, well, we sell them back to gun dealers, local gun dealers. Um, and I looked at him and there was this sort of weird moment of kind of, you know, when you're trying to kind of comprehend something and there was total silence. And I said, yeah, but if you, to be a gun dealer in Memphis, you can, you can just get one online and, and sell guns out of your vehicle um, or on eBay or Facebook. And he's like, yeah. And I was like, but that means the guns are all back on the street within three months. And he said, yeah, I guess I never thought of it like that. And he, he, he literally, um, it was like a sort of, not quite a penny dropping, but it was like, yeah, I never thought that. And it was, and that, again, another extraordinary moment. Um, this is Richard Mack. He's a former sheriff. Uh, he embodies this idea of this kind of, uh, the idea of the constitution. Uh, he, he parrots this idea of it's our, it's our constitutional right to own a gun. This was at the Soldier of Fortune convention. 
and he held up a Bible and a gun and he said, uh, with a Bible in one hand and a gun in the other, we can make this country great under God once again. Um, and, you know, again, the idea, fair enough, I'd have no problem with, I mean, I kind of do have a problem actually with holding up a Bible and a gun. It's just, in my opinion, insane. But um, the idea of protecting oneself, uh, I respect. Um, but I saw, you see moments like this and you realize how deeply embedded um, these belief systems are. So the project was published in about over 20 magazines around the world at the time, this is in the UK, it was published in Time magazine as a cover story um, all over the world. And I kind of thought, wow, you know, things are really going to change. You know, you, all photographers, well, I don't know if all, but when I grew up being a photographer, there was this idealistic idea that we do things because it might help change problematic things. Um, and I really hope that I was one tiny part in that. But over the decades, uh, the, the numbers have got worse. So 18 years after shooting those pictures that I've just shown you, I went back to make a film uh, and track down the people that I'd photographed uh, 18, between 16 and 18 years before. This is Mike and his baby who is now grown up, she's at college. And so they're in the film. Uh, and the Memphis housewives, most of them surprisingly were willing to talk to me again. This group weren't, only one of them was. Um, this woman, Vicky Sykes, um, she came up with some extraordinary views about I don't know. I mean, I can't even go there. You can watch the film. I'll, I can give you a link if anyone's interested. Um, Zed, how hard was it to get back to these people? Uh, really hard to find them because in that period of time, so many important changes had happened. Like, you know, I'd had, I had a pager at one point, not even a mobile phone. You know, I can't even remember if I had a mobile phone when I was shooting those pictures. But um, people didn't have email addresses. There was no email. Uh, it, you know, things had changed. And so there had been a, such a technological evolution that um, I was completely out of touch with these people. And, but, but what actually the saving grace was Facebook. So I found that because I had their names, I could find them through Facebook. And so that really saved the day. Um, but 18, 18 years later, people look a lot different. True, true. But, um, you know, so you just... Credit to your tenacity. Yeah, it, it, was, didn't, it took time. It took months, you know, to do it. It wasn't a couple of days. Yeah. Um, but it became an interesting thing to do. I'd always refuse to go back and do any more on the story because I always said, there's nothing new to say for me. Uh, the situation is the same, but the film was, was more interesting because it enabled me to go back. Here's Sarah Reed, uh, no longer 11 years old. She was like 28, still working in the gun store, amazingly. Um, and it gave me the chance to go back and really, uh, because it was a film, I, I could have a dialogue with them and actually argue with them a little bit. Um, and say, my question to them was, look, I met you 18 years ago. And they were like, yep. And I said, since I met you, half a million people, American citizens in their own country have been shot and killed. Half a million. It's like, uh, it's like, you know, think of these, the numbers like the Hiroshima nuclear bomb. Um, or all the wars of America put together, all of, this, all of the casualties of US soldiers killed in all of the wars. Uh, and so my question would be to them, you know, are you now, is, are, do you now feel differently? Are you willing to accept the idea of some gun control? 
uh, and that was the question. Depressingly, I have to say, often the answer was no. And this is uh, Mel who worked at Dragon Arms in Colorado, uh, not far from, uh, Colorado for some reason has had a number of shootings from the Aurora cinema shooting to Col uh, Columbine and others. Uh, this was him now. I'm going to show you a clip of him in a film. Uh, he was weird because he was strangely honest. And so he even admitted the absurdity of denying that these are assault weapons, because at the time there was an assault weapon ban. And so the, the, all the gun manufacturers got around it by calling them something else. They would modify them slightly. So they would change the length of the barrel, remove the bayonet clip, and then they would say, well, it's not an assault weapon anymore. It's now an assault style rifle. Um, and Mel himself said, this is a joke. Um, so I'm gonna show you the two clips. Jay, maybe you could play the first one. I'm gonna unshare my screen as instructed. And over to you, Jay, for the film clip. That image was quite controversial to a mm -hmm. lot of people. Some people saw it as irresponsible. Some people saw it as dangerous, threatening. Whereas other people, and I think including you, saw it as a symbol of something very different. What was it to you? Powerful, protecting. That it's my freedom. But the people who criticize you, what do they see? A right wing lunatic. His finger wasn't even on the trigger. That's not what the picture is about. He's not trying to harm me. He's trying to protect me. I'm looking out for myself, my family, my neighbors. Ah. Assault weapons seem to attract controversy. Yeah. What is that? This is a semi-automatic rifle. Is it? Is it not an assault weapon? No. Why not? Semi-automatic. One pull of the trigger, one shot. And that's what differentiates it, is it, in, in your eyes, the fact that one's fully automatic and the other isn't? Right. Why are they controversial then? Because the media and the left-wing politicians want to make boogeyman out of, out of a tool. What is an assault rifle? I mean, uh, there's such a debate even about what it is. I know, I know, and I shouldn't even call them an assault rifle. <laughs> it's a military-style weapon. That's what they want me to say. A sporting gun. You know, you know, different names, but it's the same thing. It's a military weapon. Great, Jay, if you could put the second clip on as well. Let's watch the other one as well. I got six machine guns in the house, 10,000 rounds of ammunition in the closet. With the license I have, I could get on the phone today and get a, I could order 100 machine guns and they're here in two weeks. If I could get anything, you know, I have a tank, you know, there's no end, you know. The two hot guns is what I sell, the AK-47s and the AR-15. And I got everybody beat in town with the prices because I buy so many of them. The news people come here and they always blame the gun. You know, they asked me, uh, you know, when that happened, why do you sell guns that kill people? What do you yeah. tell them? What do I tell them? I said, all these guns were on the wall last night, and I walked in this morning and nobody was dead. Yeah, you know, it's stupid. You know, a gun doesn't kill the people. The, pe the people kill the people, and they just use the gun to kill the people. You know, they can use a fork, a knife, a hammer, 
a screwdriver. You know, why keep blaming it on the gun? Okay, just give me uh, just give me forty dollars. Phone won't lock open. Yeah, so I mean, those two clips. I mean, in the film, you know, you, I meet these people, and they, you know, they've obviously they're unrepentant. They 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 feel that they're not doing anything wrong. Uh, as the film progresses, then I meet the father of a boy who was shot and killed in Columbine. Um, it gets darker and darker. Um, and more the, and more. Um, put the link in the uh, chat room for us so we can get that, for the Jake. film. Yeah. Yeah, actually, on my website, which I gave you at the beginning, if okay. you go to my website, there's a thing called film, and it's on there. It's in there. There's a film page, and you can, you can click it, and it links you to a Vimeo, and it's free to watch. It's 30 minutes, that film. It was partly commissioned by the Guardian newspaper in, in the UK. Um, and it's kind of depressing, you know, hearing was well, like, for instance, Mel, you know, he's in his gun store. He's churning out AK-47s and uh, assault rifles at a very cheap, reasonable price, because as he says, he buys so many. Uh, and there's this unwillingness to make the connection between the guns and the number of people killed. Um, and so, I mean, in a way, I've I, that, that's it. I've shown you the pictures I'm going to and, and, and the video clips. So now, if anyone has any thoughts or questions or whatever, it's a good time to, yeah. to discuss it. So, I mean, most of the people that you met who are, are part of that, part of that uh, world feel the same way. I mean, nothing changed for them, right? In, in, the, in the year. And how many different people did you meet again? About eight, not, not so not like loads and loads and loads. I mean, I tracked down the, the people that, in a way, the, the, the strongest photographs and the strongest characters were the people I wanted to talk to again. Mike and the baby had become almost like a signature picture of that project. The Memphis Housewives had won like first prize in the World Press photo competition that year. And so that had become uh, another kind of key image of the project that seemed to people responded to it because it is like a Tupperware party in the 1950s. Yeah, um, exactly. gun. And, and so these were the people I wanted to find and go back to Mel in the gun store because he was so outspoken. And he, I mean, he literally told me that gang members would come in. Uh, he would see them. They would be in the parking lot, clearly gang members. They would send in uh, like a cousin, uh, sometimes a woman uh, who had a clean record to buy weapons. And I would say, well, why would, you know, why would you do that? Why would you sell it to them? And he said, well, because it's their life. It's, their, it's, it's a legal right. This girl, she wants to buy seven weapons. I'm following the law. And the law says that, you know, a 19 year old girl with a clean record can come in and buy a whole bunch of assault rifles. Mm. Um, so, again, it, it's not his fault. You know, it's the, the, the problem is the laws and the regulations, as we know. Uh, and I guess the question is, and, you know, Sharice, this is going back to the question I had for you, whether, you know, within the sort of media circles of people who are, thinking about these issues, whether you ever hear people coming up with strategy or an idea, even if it's a kind of idealistic idea of what could happen that would make a change. Um, I mean, people have their own personal, personal thoughts and, and I guess feelings about what they think may ha may help, but I mean, I wouldn't say that there's been some definite like game plan or specifics I can mm -hmm. think of during that time, to be honest with you. Um, and I think honestly, like during those times as you're talking is by virtue of, we don't have a lot of time. Mm -hmm. um, when you're, 
when you're on those trips like that, um, everything is back to back. Um, hurry up. You know, you have to yeah, move yeah. with the motorcade and yeah. the thing is, is you're going from so you're one thing all to sitting around debating gun. Yeah, it's not really a lot, of t- a lot of time for that. Because you have like- to say as well that uh, your pictures really had a lot of compassion in them, uh, which Thank I appreciated, you. you know. So to have worked in an environment that's, as you say, is very kind of newsy and controlled. Yeah. But Terrific. I like... The fact that obviously your feelings had somehow you channeled them into those moments that you captured very effectively. And it's um, thank you. It it um, you know, when you're in those, some of them are like really quick moments. Um, I try my best to make a connection, <laughs> the mood and what's going on <laughs> in the moments that I have. Um, right yeah so you've done it you you, it works and and Um, ned Ned, any of the people that you went back to did any of them ever use a gun to defend themselves in a successful way no i mean like mike the guy with the baby he said to me you know i talked to him and i say look you know there's been another shooting here you know they're talking about teachers being armed now and he's like yeah that's what we should do we should have teachers armed and he said, every time there's a shooting, it's always in a gun-free zone, he said to me. And then in the film, I say to him, but in Columbine, there was an armed guard. There was a, you know, they have, these guys are often out of uh, police, you know, policemen who are off duty, who are doing sideline and protecting schools, getting paid. And I said, there was an armed policeman there. And he just looked at me and there was silence. I mean, I even left the silence in the film because it was just, and then he just shrugs. Uh, and now in the latest shooting, forget one armed. Yeah. But there were, there were three at the beginning, two engaging them with, in gunfire, and then 20 heavily armed police for an hour outside while people continued to be killed. So yeah. the idea mm-hmm. that, you know, an armed person is going to save the day like in the wild west is increasingly being shown to be a joke um the problem is is the level of disconnect between as you see when mike say mike's talking about he's actually quite a nice guy i mean i i get on with him perfectly well and he's even got a sense of irony and humor it's not like he can't even get a joke no I wonder how Mike would receive me if I was trying to do that. Um, Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, even I had an advantage, even if I was from New York and I went there as a white male, they wouldn't speak to me because they just think you're liberal, whatever. Mm. But because I'm from another country, they can't pigeonhole me as anything. They just see me as a freak curiosity. And so that's to my advantage. And you're right, some of them may be racist or some of them may be hostile to women or, you know, there's all sorts of different other things that could go on. Um, But... I don't think I'd be invited to the Tupperware party. No, 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 I I agree. Probably not. Um, But yeah, and I will exploit that if, if I can kind of find my way to be invited. I will do it. And... And I'll then, you know, the, the captions, that the reason they wouldn't meet me again is they said to me, you misquoted us. Oh, we did wow. not say uh, these things. Uh, and I, I said to them, well, you did. I mean, I recorded it. It's not a question of whether you said it or not. They just didn't like seeing them in print yeah. in right. Time magazine. Yeah. Um, and so, mean- so they remembered clearly, Zed, yeah, I mean the whole the whole experience and seeing it in time. So when you reach back to them, they just were, oh, we know we remember you, you're a bad guy. Yeah, all of them, all of them except that one. Yeah. And you know, an amazing thing happened. Her, her name's Vicky Sykes, and she I, I interviewed her at length, and she's in the film quite a lot. And her son rang me. And he said, the first thing he said, he said, I'm an attorney 
And I always dread this call from a lawyer, you know, who's going to sue me. And he said, I'm an attorney. I'm the son of Vicky Sykes, who appeared in your film. And so you can imagine, like, on hearing this, oh, I was no. just like, this is Get my worst. <laughs> and he said to me, and this is actually a slightly hopeful story. He said, I told her not to be in your film. I begged her not to be in your film. And I said, oh, OK. And I still didn't know where this was going. And he said, I was so angry with her. And he said, she showed the film to all of the family at Thanksgiving. And he said to me, you have captured my mother so perfectly. He said, this is the woman I grew up with. And they had guns in the cupboard, guns in the basement. He said, she doesn't see the yeah. irony of what she's doing and saying. And actually, it was very gratifying to, to think that her son, who'd grown up in this incredibly white, sort of conservative, middle class environment, had managed not to inherit her views uh, and seemed quite reasonable. Uh, and that gave me some hope. Yeah. So sometimes, you know, it's a generational thing. Um, yeah. But but like in my opinion, something, these shootings at schools, you always think it cannot not change it now. Do you know what I mean? It just oh, yeah. can't. We all feel that. We all feel that, yeah. But it doesn't. And something uh, to do with the way this has been framed, the way um, the gun owners have, have, have captured the idea that guns are somehow patriotic, um, that they're, it's sort of an American thing that, this somehow has to be shifted around, I think. And the idea that um, it's an American right, not to own a gun, but necessarily, but to, a right to safety, uh, that it's an, actually a patriotic notion that people, perhaps people should be allowed. I mean, I think it's impossible to talk about guns being banned. I don't think it's even worth wasting time hoping for that. I also think that, um, there's so many guns already in society that there is a valid argument that says if you ban guns, only the bad guys will have them. It's actually kind of true at this point. There's something so true. I think the argument is for me that, you know, people should be allowed to have guns, but under proper regulation um, that probably parallels uh, exactly the, how car ownership works which is you have a car, cars kill many people, they pollute the environment, but they're useful and people want them. Um, and, and people accept the fact that you have a license, you have to do basic training and it's registered to you as a human. Um, and you can't sell it or give it away without reassigning that ownership to someone else. So in a way there's already a model which overnight could give everybody the right to own a gun, not strip away their rights to be a law, so-called law-abiding citizen who wants to protect their family, um, but would make it harder for the guns to fall into the hands of criminals or 18-year-olds, etc. So the real challenge is how do you even begin to pursue this idea yeah. of it, here in America, it's got to um, it, it's got to be decided in Congress. What the and the thing that I see firsthand is the divide is so great on what people want to do in response to all this that goes on. Um, you know, the divide is you have this group of congressmen who. Um, you know, I, I know they said they're working on, you know, they're working on this first like real gun legislation, but it it doesn't really address those things that um, is going to really move the needle as it stands, you know, at this point. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You know, I, but I, you, you don't, these hearings and everything, you know, what I see, you know, firsthand is people are going to stick with you know, this is it. It's like a hard line of I'm not budging, you know, from this. And as long as there's this hard line, we'll just continue to have these shootings. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. You, you know, I, I just want to uh, reference that our friend, Miss Ryan, is in, um, who's been in a couple of nights, and uh, she lost a son to gun violence. And I, I know she was um, looking to speak. So how are you, Miss Ryan? I'm doing good, thank you. I'm doing very well. Very interesting conversation tonight. Now, you, in 30 years, you, you've heard it all, right? I've heard it all. I've done it all. I'm going, I haven't been with, the, with a president, but I've been with everybody else as far as high up to him to say the same thing. I mean, they tell you, you know, they, they feel you, you know, they understand and they're going to do something. But unfortunately, in 32 years that I've been doing this, I have not seen any real, real positive change in the laws, unfortunately. Let me ask you this. Do you do you speak to other moms who are in the same situation as you? Oh, yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a part of several uh, groups of moms who have all lost their children to, to gun violence. Okay. <laughs> so that's a real strong network. I mean, and that's and you find comfort there. I find comfort there and I find comfort um, talking to young people, trying to get them to think differently, you know, um, and uh, and the mothers, we all we we all band together and we cry together. We we laugh together and we go out and try to save lives together. But I mean, um, like I told you before, you know, I I couldn't save my son, but I try to try my best to save others, you know. And as as Mr. Zed was saying, you know, this is the gun. This is the kind of gun that killed my son. Mm. That's the kind of weapon that killed my son. So m- my question to the gun owners, the gun manufacturers, what's the purpose of that gun? Not not yeah. not for humans. Not for no. humans. That gun should not be on the street. You know, but the, and the manufacturer starts way back there. You know, the gun owners, of course, get the guns, but it's the manufacturers who produces it who, who, who makes the gun. You know, so that's that's my that's my issue. I, I don't understand why they would sell a gun like that. Remember, like I said, five men with that gun, with that five men had those five, had five guns, open fire on the car that my son was in, killing my son and his best friend. Wow. You know, why? Why did they have access to that gun? No, you're absolutely right. I mean, those that particular model as well was so widely used and misused and designed for indiscriminate rapid gunfire you know i mean i think they did actually manage to clamp down on that manufacturer in the end to some degree um but yeah i agree i mean you know people are so modest though now but i think people are beaten down the 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 anti-gun groups that even their hopes have been limited too much and so no one even dares talk about you know really the idea of, a, of an assault rifle, it should just be a, a clear and outright ban, for, certainly for young people, you know. Um, and I don't understand the insensitivity to it. You know, if it was their child, if it was one of their children, I'm sure they would maybe possibly do the same thing that other mothers do. Go out here and try to appeal to them and let yeah. them know, you know, you, had to, you gotta do something. Something has got to be done. What's really extraordinary is that in these school shootings, you know, they're often white kids and the, the, the killers are, are always or often white kids too. So you'd think that, that finally they might, you know, because some of them are just deeply racist, I think, as well. They, they don't feel like it's their problem. That you can show them the, the horror of, of gang violence, of kids that have been mown down, of innocent people in communities that have been shot and killed in crossfire. I don't think it fundamentally touches them, but you'd think that these high school shootings would. And so that's when it gets even more confusing that something like that can happen and that they still won't talk about gun control. Then you realize that it's, a, it's purely a psychological issue. Uh, you know, and the only way I think you can combat it is trying to, you know, use the same strategies that the people like the NRA have done. Um, you know, w- one thing we've learned over the course of this week is that, you know, we all have to do something. We have to own it a little bit ourselves. 
whether it's protesting or calling your congressman or filling envelopes, you know, like it has to be sort of this grassroots things where we all, we all chip in in some way to make our politicians do something, move this, move this along with some type of restriction, some type of, some type of something that says, you know, we want to help you because it, it appears everything you read, most of the members of the NRA are okay with background checks, are okay with, with limiting this and limiting that. It's just, you know, the politicians and the money that's involved in that gets in the way, you know, uh, unless, you know, I mean, I, who, who wants that? But, uh, you know, unless some politician's kid gets it, who's, you know, on the right, you know, which nobody wishes on anybody. Nobody, nobody. Right? I mean, you know that, Ms. Rollins. You know, no way. like, what, what is going to be the telling moment? Because we've had moments already. We've had enough moments that should make the world spin in another direction by now. I mean, what else could it be? Yeah, like, but, what, how, how much worse could it be? What, what more could that? it be? You know, it, it, it's almost like you have to vote these guys out yeah. who, won't, who won't move. Exactly. Right. I mean, just got to do it. And whether and, and it takes, you know, folks like us to go to one of those states and you know stuff envelopes just to get these, you know, these other you know guys out so that we can put two or three other people in just and change, change the equation. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's crazy. Yeah, um, I, I thought after Newtown, I was yeah. like, okay, that's the moment. Like all the, you know, the little kids and those faces, like no one can look at that and not want to you know, make changes that, so to help that not to happen again. And then, you know, when you didn't see the needle move on that and it just continued and, you know, at first churches were sacred, like you would never think that something like that could happen at a church. And then here we go. And then yeah. you would think, hmm, when I go grocery shopping, that couldn't happen. Like it's, it touches every facet um, of life so that nothing is sacred at this point. And so far, nothing and has television. really moved the needle, you know, for any yeah. regulation or anything, at least for like sensible, you know, I know when you use the terms like ban and no, like, I think it really like hits people to you're trying to take away my freedom. You're trying to take, you know, from me when you use wording like, you know, like and that. It's, but, and it's really important that you say that to understand their side. You know, yeah. well, you know, you because those guys really feel they need to protect themselves, and that's you know, we all say that's fine. Just you yeah. know, let, let's get a little bit of a uh, a little bit of sanity into an insane situation. That's you I, know, I think it, it boils down to when you tell someone no, like you can't have no, especially when you've been used to having it, and then somebody says no. I mean, if you come on, look at look at the whole mask mandate thing, like how people fought that you know, so hard, like, you can't make me where I'm at, just because they were told, you know, people were told no, you know, I, I, I know when I was out working and wore a mask, I got yelled at for wearing a mask. So mm -hmm. it's like, which is it? Can I have the right to want to wear a mask? Like, just as you don't want to wear one, can't I on my body, like, wear a mask if I want to? Absolutely. Teresa, I have a question for you because you're in the political, I've been following you for a while, but oh. you're in the political uh, venue Ellen. of Ellen Rosenberg. That. So we're, I can't remember, were you shooting, were you photographing when Trump was in office? Had you moved into the political, you had. Yeah. So um, yeah, that's what I thought. So is there um, a different, is there a time when you um, hear the nonsense of the guns? Because you're talking about, unfortunately, that side of the party where they want to believe in everyone's rights. That you're help, hold, you hold, you sh you photograph differently, or how do you handle being within that environment and yeah. then walking out? Yeah, I um, I Great honestly place. don't um, photograph differently. Excuse me. Um, because I believe in showing people who they are. So I believe in showing what you, what you give me, like what you show me, it's a reflection. Um, so I'm documenting, you know, what you're showing me as I see it. So, you know, and 
I will say like my inside conversations, maybe like, you know, I don't agree with certain things, um, but I, I honestly don't shoot it different though. I go into this, this mode of just trying to like separate from all of that and show what I see, mm. show what I hear. Which you have to, which is very different than Zed after yeah. he came back from yeah. when you did your lat when you did your book. They're right. complete opposites of yeah. how what you want to show. Thank yeah, you. no matter um, because honestly, like during during that time of covering the Trump administration, um, it was very volatile for the press and you know for journalists uh, because he set a tone and a I mean he would say we would walk in the room he's like there they go look at him like the enemy of the people <laughs> so it like created this whole like tension where you know we would come into room sometimes and get these like stairs people would hold their phones up they would walk up to the press area and just hold their phone up and like record um you know I've been called names um I haven't been, you know, physically, you know, harmed or anything, but I have colleagues who have had things thrown at them that wasn't water. Um, so it, it was very volatile, but yet, like, you got to give it up to, to them to continue to stay there and do the work, to continue to, continue to stay there and report no matter, you know, your surroundings or what's being yeah. said or, you know, it's just like some things have been, I will say, have been very like volatile. And, um, you know, there have been instances where not covering things at the White House, but covering things like on the streets or, you know, different rallies or things that would come through where it was very dangerous. Um, and sometimes I would just, I don't know, like, even block that out and find myself like right there next to someone in the heart of something, um, you know, before something was going to erupt. And I'm standing here like, okay, what am I doing? <laughs> what am I doing right here? But, um, you know, I was just led to, you know, position myself certain places where my train, the training that I had to do, like the conflict training and things like that would have told me like, don't go there. Mm. <laughs> don't go in that area don't put yourself there don't be inside of this circle like you know but sometimes I was just led to be there well um yeah it's um yeah it, it's obviously a um it's an incredibly complex uh issue when it on some levels it's really a simple issue right I mean it's it's you know it's about responsibility and trying to find some type of a middle ground but i think if you know we all let our voices be heard through whether it's through imagery or words or volunteering i think you know we that's what we have to do you guys have to continue to show us and we have to be motivated and um so i thank you all for coming and i thank annette and Cherise for presenting tonight i mean you really um you know sort of uh, put the bow tie on this week of um, of a lot of intense, tense work. I see Ellen nodding there. Um, thanks for staying up, Nick. Yeah. Right, really. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for staying up and right. um, you know, to two here. <laughs> well, uh, I owe you a beer the next time uh, you know I'm there or you're here or anyone else who's here owes Net Net Zed a beer. Um, okay. I'll tie you up on that. All right, there you go. Um, but you know, Ned, why don't you give Zed? Why don't you give us your you know final word, and then Sharice, and we'll call it a night and get to a weekend. Well, I don't know if I have a final word. I mean, you know, sometimes I feel a bit negative about it, but I also do think, as you've said, that uh, all the stuff that people do does actually go into this pool. And if you think of a country like, say, like South Africa where you had apartheid, uh, it seemed impossible that that was ever going to change. And it did. Um, it took a lot of time and it took someone like Nelson Mandela and everything else, but it did 
change. And the same with the tobacco industry. At some point, it seemed impossible that they, they would be sued and held accountable for everything they did. Um, so I do think there's always hope and everything that people do on these small grassroots levels is important. But yeah, it is, it's a big deal.